Uh, feel free to mute yourselves or even to turn your cameras off if you're not speaking or, or talking. Um, just to save some bandwidth here and uh, yeah, perfect. But also feel free to say hello. You can also type in the chat what lake you're joining us from or where you're joining us from. That would be great. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my name's David Petrosky. I'm with the Muriel Lake Basin uh, Management Society. Uh, you may have had uh, Richard Bourgeois uh, um, before, uh, joining before. Um, I've just joined. I just lost the audio there, but um, yeah. Uh, very happy to have Muriel Lake Basin Management Society here. They were one of the speakers at our previous sessions on low water levels. They've had quite a, an experience with losing almost five meters of vertical depth in their lake um, over the years. Wendy, thanks for joining us. Nice to see you in the chat there. Wendy's from Environment and Protected Areas. Great. Sorry, I had just got knocked off there for- <laughs> Yeah, no worries. We heard that you're from Muriel Lake Basin Management and that uh, you're new to the group and that Richard had been representing you guys at previous meetings. And we've got Rick in the chat. Hey, Rick, thanks for joining us. We've got Baptiste and Island Lake. Kendra, nice to see you. Uh, Eric from City of Calgary and also a director on the alms board. We've got Devin, also a director on the alms board. So yeah, lots of good folks in the room today. Paula, nice to see you. Um, these are fun because it's just like, you know, all my friends. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's 12.03. Still some people uh, joining in the uh, meeting, but I will go ahead and start with at least some introductions here. So for those who don't know me, my name is Bradley Peter. I'm the executive director here at the Alberta Lake Management Society. The Lake Stewardship Community of Practice project is something we started just over a year ago with support from the Land Stewardship Center of Canada. And it was really a program designed to create a space where our stewardship partners could share and connect with one another. Uh, we want to make sure that stewards are informed of all the great work happening in Alberta and that they're not feeling like they're reinventing the wheel with their ideas or working in silos. So this is a chance to meet and, and hear from each other. Um, there's been, over the past couple of years, a, a few stewardship groups that have closed down for various reasons, and, and that's always a bit discouraging. Uh, so today, we're going to focus instead on stewardship groups that are new to Alberta that have just recently formed, and hear a bit about the issues and opportunities that they're working on, and a little bit about um, the lakes that they're interested in. If you have ideas for future topics for community of practice meetings, just let us know. Happy to create a space for you all to learn and, and share from each other. We also have Kelsey Norton on the call today from the North Saskatchewan Watershed mm -hmm. Association, who's been North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance, who's been really, really instrumental in this project and running her own lake stewardship project as well at the NSWA. So I just want to give a shout out to Kelsey and all the good work she's doing over there. She is on the call today, but in a noisy spot at the University of Alberta. So I don't think she is necessarily going to be able to chime in. Um, we'll see. So just a reminder, if you're not speaking, feel free to keep yourself muted. The meeting is being recorded as well. So if you don't want your face on the recording, you can also keep your camera off. And we will try to distribute this recording to folks after the meeting so that it's it'll be posted on our website 
and, and sent back around to our email list. So today, like I said, we have three representatives from new stewardship groups in Alberta. I don't know if these are necessarily the only new groups or the newest, but these are groups that we've connected with and I thought it would be nice to uh, introduce them to the community of practice. So we have Julie from up in Lac La Biche, we have Dan from up at Sturgeon Lake, and we have Ken just over east of Edmonton at Cooking Lake. So I want to go ahead and, and pass it over to Julie from Healthy Waters Lac La Biche, who's going to give us a bit of an intro. Then we'll hear from Dan and from Ken, and then there will be lots of time for questions and discussion. So Julie, why don't I pass it over to you and you can go ahead and get us started off here. Okay, um, Healthy Waters is um, a group that I've been involved with since the very, very beginning. And I see that Colin Cote and Julia Shapka are online here too. They are also board members. So unmute yourself and if you wanna add something or you know if I forgot something or got it wrong, make sure you let me know and you can speak up when you want. Okay, Colin and Julia, thank you. The ones who should be here are Brian DeHare, who is a teacher and is teaching in schools today, or Michael Schultz, who was our scientist who actually got this group going. And neither of them are able to be here today. So, so I'm here, I'm vice president of the group and I guess the shoe came over to me. Um, it has, the, the interest in this group started quite a few years ago um, out of some of us that were concerned about the protection and the preservation of the lake and also concerned that there was a lot of turnover in the county board and that meant that new councillors needed awareness and education about what were the current issues and practices and what was going on. So um, it was in March of 2020, 2018 that Brian and Mike had talked to a lot of people and gotten an organizational meeting going. There was a good cross section of people, probably about 40 um, at that meeting in March, um, a board was chosen and um, we were fortunate to have a lot of various skills on the board. We had scientist, a town, uh, town councillor, teacher, accountant, um, social media expert, those kinds of things. And they, it was just really wonderful board. Um, in 2019, we registered as a society so we could get grants and we could partner better with county and provincial people. Um, the strength of the board really moves with the skills of the members is what we have found. And so um, where we have people that are very skilled in an area, that's where we flourish for those years that they're on the board. Um, our constitution or our bylaws do not tell us we have limited terms. So we really like to keep those people on board for a while. Um, early on, there was a public meeting to um, hosted by the town the municipal, the county government, um, to look at the passing of a bylaw for environment for environmental reserve and riparian um, concerns, and that meeting was a little bit fiery from people that didn't understand it, and we really understood very early on that there was a huge need for education. So you asked us to talk about challenges and achievements. Um, I suppose the first real challenge we have is blue-green algae, which is kind of typical across the world, across Alberta, I guess. That would be the public opinion of being the first concern. And, and that is ours, and we make it a point to try to address to people how to deal with this. Um, but I would also say our other challenge is people. Um, <laughs> there's a wide range of how people feel they should be dealing with, with this kind of issue. Probably 51% are on board in principle, probably 49% are, nobody's gonna tell me what to do with the land that I own right down to the lake, of course. And about 1% are prepared to um, make it a time commitment and work with us on the board. So um, people are really at land shore owners, um, don't understand that they don't own right down to the lake. Um, and, and they aren't about ready to be told that they don't. Um, we find farmers need to be educated in it, town planners, counselors, um, the, the whole council and the mayor. We've had very good mayor and council 
um, relationships and um, people that were on board. And I have to really hand it to him. Colin, you were one of the counselors there and how much we appreciated your representation on the board. But we've had, you know, the gamut of commitment and the gamut of people prepared to kind of do something about it. Um, we understand that we are advisory. We don't force anybody, adults, however, are influenced by their kids. And so we believe in school education um, because, oopsie, something happened here. Am I still on board for you? You still, still see me? We can still hear you and you still, we can still see you. Yeah. You can? Okay. I can't see anybody. So, oh dear. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I would like to say that education um, has been one of our top priorities. We early on developed a pamphlet um, about healthy waters to help people understand what it's about. And inside are some of the objectives. And that obviously is what we would like to be achieving and what we would like to be looking at. We want uh, undergirding, underpinning everything is um, education and activities to improve or maintain the water quality, whether it is scientific or educational or whatever, this is our underlying commitment. Um, education has been a big deal and public outreach. Our first grant was for open houses from EcoTrust. We had five locations identified across our region. We developed um, large display boards for education with a large range of topics from science and ownership laws to what can you do to recreation to what is water stewardship, lots of education. We've used these boards for education a lot since that time. Um, we've put them up in Bold Center in the Recreation Center and Festival Place at Plamondon at the museum, any place that they'll put them up, we've had them up. Um, however, the open houses were kind of poorly, were doomed because of COVID. They had to be postponed the first year and the second year that in 2021, when we did try to do them, there was very low attendance. So that was kind of discouraging, but oh well, we tried, tried to get the name out, tried to get the message out. As I said, schools are a big thing. Um, Brian works with the grade fivers and eight, that's in their curriculum. And we had a, one of the teachers was on our board for a while and she was magnificent with the grade eight kids. We figure that if you can get the kids to understand that there are better ways of dealing with, with lake shore and with watershed, if the kids understand, they'll talk to their parents, they'll get to their grandparents and they may get to them better than any, any other method. So we do like to work in the schools. This past summer, we worked with Leica. Um, we're able to use a program they call Keep Our Lakes Blue. And that is a grassroots program. Um, I went to the farmer's market and tried to talk to people and get them involved in that program this summer, um, trying to get people to realize that what you do is important. Each person's actions are important. We also have signs at boat launches and um, those were early on in our in our history um, for washing your boat and, and basic watershed care. We uh, One of our objectives is to build relationships. Our open houses caused us to approach a lot of presenters from many different watershed and environmental groups. Um, and that was great contacts and very important. Um, we really benefited more from learning who you were <laughs> probably. And, and have been able to foster good relationships with Cows and Fish and Ducks Unlimited, um, Athabasca Watershed Council and LICA. And you folks, we love the fall meetings that you have. Um, where we need work is with the First Nations. And we, we talk with them, but we really haven't been able to get First Nations people on board on, you know, on the, you know, to be a part of the part of the group. But they have input and I'm glad of that. Um, our, another objective is research. We had a grant from Land Stewardship Center that um, we, we were able to um, hire Kristen Anderson to do a wetlands inventory. And we promote the use of these findings in municipal development and planning for permits. Sometimes, sometimes that doesn't go so good. Sometimes we aren't so, so successful, but we feel that we need to bring it to their attention that the water the, the, the wetlands shouldn't be paved over, shouldn't be given great huge, you know, um, shopping center areas and things like that. 
Um, our people are on committees for the Water Management Impl Implementation Committee. Um, and we are really pleased with our working relationship with the county. Excellent municipal staff. Um, Julia is on the staff, um, and we so appreciate your involvement, Julia. Um, we want to support those, their activities like Environment Week, and they um, did a, a rain garden next to our recreation center, and we had volunteers there helping to plant it, that sort of thing. We really want to cooperate with them. Um, just in conclusion, our biggest challenges would be not to be discouraged with setbacks. When people don't get it and things don't happen the way we hope, we, we need to keep on trucking. That we have to keep on educating, keep on that, that if anything should sort of set us in our commitment to work. Um, we know that there's a council reticence to implement stronger bylaws for environment reserve and repairing setback. And it, we really need to, I, we would love to see things like that happening in the future. Um, we feel it's a challenge to utilize indigenous people that we aren't really doing that and we need to. We also know that the board is as strong as the commitment and skills of the members. And we need to maintain society membership. And that has been a big one. We've been kind of a little bit lax in working on membership and our membership is not huge. So we need to be working on that. Um, and we don't have the money for personnel or any hired staff, so we depend totally on, on volunteer hours. And um, that usually means that there are a few people that work really pretty hard and a few others that um, are supporting in, in principle, but probably don't do the work. Um, just to conclude, I wanna leave us with a thought that I saw from Robert Swan, said the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And I just wanna challenge us with that to realize that the someone else is us. Are there any comments, Colin or Julia, that you would like to add? Uh, Julie, thank you so much for presenting. You, you <laughs> paint a really, really good picture of what Healthy Waters is. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I echo and agree with everything you've said. That's 100%. Uh, Possibly the only thing I could expand on is uh, the benefits of collaboration between mm -hmm. like uh, Athabasca Watershed, uh, Thank you. Uh, yes. the uh, Alms, all of these groups. It, it seems like it's the same people crossing paths and we're all passionate about the same thing. And that is one of our strengths. Absolutely. Thank you, Colin, for that. Yeah. Great. That's fantastic. Are there any questions? We have time for maybe one or two questions for Julie. Nothing right off the bat. Um, and if there are questions as well, feel free to throw them into the chat. I see Julia Shapka is saying, great job, Julie. <laughs> Very well said. Um, yeah, and I appreciate you leaving us with that quote. I'm always... Um, blown away that so much lake stewardship and management happens from volunteer groups with no funding uh, and very little support. So it's it's always impressive. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. I think we'll pass it over now to Dan from Sturgeon Lake, who's going to introduce us to some of the opportunities and challenges that exist up there. And I think maybe we did catch Alberta's newest stewardship group with Sturgeon because I think Dan you were saying you just got status like this week or last week so yes. um, thanks for joining us and yeah you can take it away. Thank you Brad and hello everyone and and uh, yeah uh, certainly will echo some of the things that Julie said as well but um, so um, my name is Dan Gorman I live in Grand Prairie about an hour away from Sturgeon Lake um, have a, a, a lakeside cottage there and my family has had a cottage on the other side of the lake for about 60 years. Um, so uh, this all started because a number of concerns came up over this last year, year and a half to do with the uh, blue-green algae, uh, also lake level issues, um, a lot of dead fish, uh, a lot more than, than normal and stuff. And so we, we kind of got our heads together and decided to um, um, 
start this uh, stewardship society. And uh, so we had a couple of Zoom meetings with a number of different areas in the lake. Um, Julie, one of the first things we did was go after the uh, the indigenous group, the uh, uh, Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, uh, met with the chief and uh, and actually toured their areas and their land and tried, tried to build that relationship up right at the very beginning because we recognized that without that, we weren't really going to be that successful with whatever we were looking at. Um, we had a big meeting on July the 20th. Um, I've had two knee replacements this year. One was on July the 7th and one in the beginning of February. So we were trying to get this thing done in between. Um, I was uh, asked and tasked with the idea of being the, the president, at least for the first year until this thing got off the ground. So we had a meeting in, in, um, in Valley on the 20th of July. And we had everybody from Alberta Agriculture and Irrigation, Alberta Forestry, Alberta Environment and Protected Area, Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance, the Town of Valleview, the MD of Greenview, and all the different areas that were um, represented around the lake from Boyd Lakeshore to Sandy Bay to, um, anyways, there was about, I don't know, 25, 30 people there. And, um, uh, and uh, about three or four people from the, uh, uh, from the reserve that were there as well. And uh, it was a very, very productive meeting, a very good meeting. And uh, uh, the whole um, the whole focus was the idea that we were looking at the long-term uh, best interests of the lake and, and whatever decisions would be made by the society that was formed and moving forward would be, would be based that way. And that we had no, there was no hidden agendas or no prior agendas brought into the meeting. And uh, uh, so with that, um, I was told that we would never get all of these people in the room together agreeing with each other. Um, we did. Um, I set the tone really early and just said, you know, we're, we're going to be polite and respectful to each other. And and for those of you that, that find that too difficult to do, we'll gently ask you to leave and we'll send you the minutes later. Uh, but this will be a, a real positive meeting. And, and then on the inside, I'm anxiously just hoping that it's going to be that way. And it was. Um, so we, um, what came out of everything especially was uh, that um, the Cree Nation was very, very interested in, in uh, uh, finding out, you know, what could be done long-term or what type of a, uh, a group could be put together to work with them and with the MD and the town and the stuff to, uh, to look at the long-term benefits uh, uh, for the lake. So um, one of the things that came out was um, as well, uh, we had a weird problem. Um, some people had um, from the lake had gone and added on to our weir. There's been a weir that's been there for, since about 1955, 1960. And, um, and the town of Valleview had basically um, uh, got water from Sturgeon Lake for a number of decades. And then they stopped a few decades ago. And, and uh, anyway, um, uh, some people decided that with the lake level being very low, and I mean, probably the lowest it's been in 60, 70 years, for example, um, most of the boats weren't able to use most of the boat launches to get their boats off Williamson Provincial Park uh, normally on July the first weekend. That's the busiest day of the year. And uh, there was one vehicle there this July 1st because you could get your vehicles into the water, but you couldn't get them back out. Excuse me. When I talk too much, I cough, I apologize. So <laughs> it's not a good habit to have, especially during the pandemic, it wasn't a good thing. But anyway, um, so with this weird thing, um, the government, um, Chaudhry and his team <laughs> decided that this group had not approached anybody, which they hadn't to put the weir up. So they had Alberta Transportation to tear the weir down, the weir addition, sorry clarify that it was about a foot and a half edition anyway there was lots of discussion back and forth <laughs> I'm so sorry everyone um should there be a weir should there not be a weir um um you know what are the levels of the lake compared to the way to where it's been before um if the weir is put in and it does raise the level of the lake how will that affect all the different areas we did not have lidar on the lake done So we have just had that completed actually last Thursday um, due to the wonderfully uh, warm fall, we were able to get that done because most of the stuff that's happened uh, this year has happened over the last couple of months. 
Um, uh, like Brad said, we just registered as a society over this last week. Um, and we're going to have our, our AGM is going to be in January or early February. We had to just kind of um, throw some names uh, together that, that have been doing the work uh, for now just to get this thing set up. Much along the same lines as Julie, in order to get grants and stuff, we needed to have the society formed. <laughs> and we have approached the MD to cover the cost of the LIDAR. It was about 20000 to do the area of the lake that we had people at. And I may have to, <coughs> excuse me, I might have to have Julie take over for me here. Yeah, if you need a moment too, Dan, we can give you a, a second. I'm happy to um, like do some juggling or I could like sing a little song or something. <sighs> excuse me, I should be okay. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's embarrassing, but it's been that way for about eight years now. So there's really nothing much I can... Yeah, no, you're doing great. I'm curious about the LIDAR. Um, the MD was happy to put the bill for that work? Or oh, was I that a... That, I wouldn't go that far, but I will. Okay. Um, I made a presentation to them on October the 25th. And um, they are very interested in the LIDAR information. Um, you know the drainage issues and a bunch of other issues at the lake that the LIDAR information would be very beneficial to them. Both the town and the MD have said as much and asked uh, if we um, if if we were supported with this grant, would they have access to the information, which I said, absolutely. Um, and they said, well, if we don't, would we have access to the information? I said, absolutely not. Um, so um, Mind you, we would probably give it to them later anyway, but I needed, I did not want to take the incentive for them helping support us with a grant. Um, so um, we're supposed to find out in the middle of January and we were going to wait until then, but a number of us got together. Uh, there's a lot of people around the lake that are interested in having that LIDAR done. And they have said that if we don't get the support financially from the MD that, that we will cover it internally ourselves. So the person that did the LIDAR is also a person that I've known in business for 25 years. And I, I I basically said to him, if we can assure you that we will pay you within 60 days, will you go ahead and do the LIDAR if it's available over this three-day window? And uh, they were able to make it happen. So, And he said, absolutely, um, as long as I have your word, then we're, we're good to go. So no, we haven't got a yes yet, but they were very, very... It was very well received, the presentation that we made. There was about 15, 20 slides. Uh, we were able to show a number of different uh, uh, reasons that it would benefit not just uh, our our uh, Sturgeon Lake Society group, but but also uh, you know the town and the MD as well. So we're, we'll, we'll find out on that. I may be going back to do a part two um, uh, presentation on uh, December the 12th, I believe. I was just phoned yesterday. And um, I used to... Um, I used to be the manager of Evergreen Park. I don't know if you guys know Evergreen Park up here, but it's a fairly big, um, uh, a, a big thing. It's got restaurants and casinos and racetracks and you know all of that stuff, um, uh, banquet halls and and so a good part of my job for the last eleven years has been to get um, grants and to work with the county of Grand Prairie and and the municipalities and stuff. So I'm. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. And uh, so we have a number of grants that we're looking at applying for just now, now that we're going to be a society. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we're really, really trying to continue to work with that uh, Cree Nation, uh, although um, they just had some turmoil. And one of the people that was going to be on our, our uh, board as a, as a director from the society had a falling out with the chief and they are not speaking to each other and neither one of them wants to be on the board if the other one is. So we've got to get that all straightened out and a few other things internally that they're working on. But, um, and the fact that, you know, they lost about 70 buildings during the wildfire. Um, and so they're working on getting all those rebuilt right now, which is obviously, you know, the main concern for them. Um, also, um, the, the, that wildfire mitigation is something that we're focusing on as well. Um, one of the things that came up was that um, even even from the uh, fire chiefs and stuff that that were involved with the wildfire that mainly hit, you know, it missed uh, you know most of our areas thankfully, but uh, it did hit the reserve fairly strong and 
and he had said had the deadfall been cleared closer to the lake, um, it would have it would have saved some more homes. And so that's something that they're working on finding a resolve that because the MD up in this point up until this point has been you know fairly firm on on the fact that that none of the deadfall is to be removed. But and now they're they are being much more open to it um, to. Uh, at least uh, based on their approval to to removing a number of that uh, that deadfall. Um, like to thank uh, Don um, Don uh, Davidson, I believe, um, from Pigeon Lake. I think he's even on the call here, um, who helped us out with some information on their bylaws, and so we were able to uh, uh, to you know make make us some changes that fit our lake, but it, it did help us. Uh, from starting from scratch on that. So thanks very much, Don. Um, what else? Um, our local MLAs are helping support us on this. Um, I think I think I've mentioned most, you know, our challenges are very similar, but we're so new. I think a year from now, I'd be glad to share through the same challenges, but getting people and getting, you know, getting support. But But people have been very open so far just because of the fact that we have said Everything is going to be based on doing what is best for the long-term benefit of the lake, and uh, um, you know if that winds up hurting the area that I'm on uh, because we can't have something done there that isn't going to be for the betterment of the overall lake, then that's fine. Uh, so be it. We won't like it, but we will support it, and we're asking others to do the same. So so far, uh, people have been very supportive of what we're doing, and. But we're very early in the game, and it's easy to say you bet so far. So we're we'll we'll wait and see. We'll talk in a year. But that's all I've got. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. Um, it's a great point you made, and that Julie kind of uh, mentioned as well is that the strength of these groups is often like within the strength of the members, and to have you uh, with grant writing experience and relationships with the town and the county, like I think that's tremendous so um yeah good on you for taking on this work and applying those relationships and skills to help the lake that's incredible um are there any questions for dan before we jump into our next presentation nothing yet i'm really also glad to hear that you were able to connect with Don out at pigeon lake and share some of those resources that's you know what this group is for and then the LIDAR work, I think, is very similar to what was happening up at Muriel Lake Basin as well. Um, so, yeah, great to, to hear there's some um, similarities in the work and sharing of information here. Um, someone did ask in the, in the chat, if you have an ultimate goal of establishing a watershed management plan, or is it still kind of too early to say? You know, um, that's a really good question. It looked like it was Kendra that had asked that. Um, um, thanks, Kendra. We have been in discussion with Rhonda Gauthier. Uh, I'm trying to remember the last, but she's got a hyphenated name. Anyway, she was at uh, that meeting that we had held on July the 20th. And um, I actually just contacted her um, over this, this uh, since the invitation came in for this meeting, because I thought, well, hopefully I'll have a chance to have uh, talked to her by then. Um, she's with the Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance, and she's willing to work with us to help set that up. So uh, we do have a goal, but that's about as specific as I can get at this time. Um, Rhonda Clark Goche is, is her name. So I'm just waiting for her to get back to us and hopefully I can give you an update on that. Uh, but yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, that's great, great to hear. <laughs> you bet. Yeah, the connection with the local WPAC is often critical for some of those developing some of those more planning or technical documents. So I'm glad to hear you've already connected with MPWA there. You bet. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. Let's uh, switch over now to Ken from the Cooking Lake Moraine Society. Cooking Lake Moraine Watershed Society. <laughs> Ken, you can clarify the acronym for us. I will. Um, <laughs> but really happy to have you here. I know you guys are part of um, some interesting initiatives out there. And yeah, I'll pass it over to you uh, to share a bit about your group. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Ken Quackenbush. I'm uh, I'm the president of CLMSS, <laughs> Cooking Lake Moraine Stewardship Society. Um, yeah, I've been 
involved with uh, Brad and ALMS for a few years with the Lake Keepers program and also the Lake uh, Lake Watch program on Hastings Lake, uh, winter and summer. Um, I'm an engineer, but uh, so not a scientist, but I have a real interest in the water quality and water um, quantity issue that we're seeing. And um, I'm just going to flip over here to share screen because I put a few slides together just to keep me focused here a little bit. Perfect. I'll let you know when we can see the presentation. Are you seeing that? Uh, not yet. Go to on Zoom. Go to that green button at the bottom that says says share screen again. So go back to your Zoom window, and then there should be a green button there. Oh, it's blue, but yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, and then if you kind of maximize that okay. screen, uh, uh, we're, yeah. we're still seeing your uh, browser window. Um, so I think we just need to. See the, there it is. I can see it now. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Great. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of an overview of where we are, and um, and you know, kind of describe the, the issue that we're dealing with. It's not a recent issue. It's been going on a long time, and um, and then I'll describe a little bit about what we've been doing for a couple of years, and then what we're now doing as a society so i just need to figure out okay so the study area uh that we're that we're part of is the cooking lake marine uh inside of strathcona county so the marine is an area of higher elevation just southeast of edmonton and um it uh, it's just a couple hundred feet higher than the surrounding prairies, but it, it's quite unique in that it's uh, got a knob and kettle landscape that was left over from the last uh, glacier event, and it would naturally be uh, very wet, and and so that is changing now. Um, the Cooking Lake Marine is also known as the Beaver Hills Marine. And it's the, the marine itself is quite a lot bigger than the area that we're focused on. We're just focusing on the, the three main body lakes of uh, Monistic, Cooking, and Hastings. Um, to include the whole watershed would be, uh, I should ask, can you see my, my pointer? I can, yes. Okay, so down here in the bottom of the screen is Miquelon. And so the watershed started at Miquelon and then flows north through Larry, Joseph, Oliver, Monistic into Cooking, Cooking into Hastings. Um, we have Half Moon that contributes up here. Um, uh, Antler Lake that contributes into North Cooking. And then from Hastings, it flows out to Beaver Hill Lake and then back to the North Saskatchewan River. So um, that's where we are. Um, it really hasn't behaved like a uh, watershed with surface water flow for probably 70 years, maybe more. Um, it's it's behaving more like uh, typical prairie closed basin, closed body lakes. And um, so the, the water quality is changing drastically as a result of that as well. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get the screen change here. So what we found um, when we first started out, uh, Mike Boyd was uh, in, had a real interest out in our area at uh, Lakeview and um, was looking at lake levels and the history of the area and um, discovered that we had a huge data gap in terms of um, missing data for blocks of time prior to about 19... Uh, 60. So um, one of the efforts was to go around and ask people with photographs of old photographs of the lake relative to um, known known um, buildings or trees or rocks or something that's still there today. So this is just an example of one point that he picked up for 1930 water level. So in this picture is the original Manning Cottage still exists on the shore of uh, South Cooking Lake community. Um, 
And so you can see in here, there's a, there's a water level that's fairly close to the cabin. He overlaid a present day picture and it doesn't show up here all that great, but this is all grass out here now. But um, by overlaying that, you can walk out there and put a stick in the ground where the water shore, the shore used to be, and then take an elevation of it and get a data point that way. So he did a lot of work around the lake with different homeowners, wherever they could get pictures that had known dates with them. So we filled in uh, a few gaps where they were missing. Um, similarly, over in Monistic, um, there was a period of time where we had pretty good data collection on water levels. Um, and then 2016, it ended. And so we have a huge gap again. We know the water's gone down quite drastically um, from that time. But oh, I shouldn't say drastically, because that's relative to what you're going to see. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that, that's just pointing to one of the challenges we have is water quality data, water quantity data, or lake elevation data is hard to come by. Um, there's lots of history here. Um, the Beaver Hills area was recognized as a pretty special place way back um, when they designated two pretty big plots of, of land to a bird sanctuary, another big parcel to um, Forestry Reserve, which is now the Blackfoot Cooking Lake uh, Recreation Area. Um, it was designated as a, a UNESCO site in 2016. So there's some, some value that's been uh, assigned to the area, um, but it hasn't got a lot of traction as far as dealing with the, the loss of water issue. So that's where we come in. Oops, go the other way. So for Monistic, um, this is a view looking west towards Sherwood Park. So the Monistic Lake used to be where I'm circling with my arrow here all the way around. It's shaped a little bit like a horseshoe. It had this peninsula out here. And what we have today is a, sort of a, a cell here, in uh, which is the southwest. Uh, another cell which... Um, in the winter, it shows up quite well. In the summer, it's just loaded with uh, um, growth and islands and that. Then around the corner up here and here are just hay fields now. Um, this is Cooking Lake, Lake to the north. So Monistic used to drain into Cooking Lake. Um, it's about a hundred foot elevation difference between the two. Um, and when I'm sampling in Monistic in the summer, it, it's um, interesting because the, the water quality is crystal clear. It's got a lot of really quite beautiful green algae in it. Um, and so it's quite different than what we're seeing over in Cooking or Hastings. I don't keep going the wrong way. So Cooking Lake, um, this is how it would have looked um, about 50 years ago, roughly, I guess. Um, we are now, if you were to draw um, a bathymetric line in here at about the two meter mark. Uh, that's where our lake is now. So it's it's actually South Cooking Lake is now split into two cells. North Cooking Lake is basically just a swamp. Uh, this creek from North Cooking to Hastings hasn't flowed for 70 years. Uh, Sisseb Lake is a hayfield. Um, we still have contribution from McFadden and Half Moon periodically and from um, um, Antler Lake up here periodically. This creek that's shown down here is from Monistic, hasn't flowed for a very long time. So that's um, current status. Of, this is just another view of, of uh, cooking. This is north cooking here, which is basically a slough now. It used to be connected through some narrows. And then south cooking, you can see is, uh, well, in 21, you could still get through here. You could paddle a canoe through here. Uh, today you can't anymore. You can walk through, but uh, it's it's split. Uh, so last summer, at one of our public events, um, we put this sign up, and it's made of nine sheets of plywood. So it's full scale in the elevation side. Um, so this seven thirty five. I know it's hard to read, but seven thirty five meters above sea level is actually seven thirty five. So. You can see back in the early 1900s, 
um, our water level was, um, well, that's 12 feet, so 14, 15 feet deep if you were standing here on the shore. And so you follow it down in the 50s. Sometime in the 50s is when flow stopped flowing uh, from North Cooking into Hastings. So we're missing a whole bunch of data oops, in this period. Um, through, you know, and there has been some cycle to it over the years. And because of that, there's always been an argument that, oh, it's just a cycle. It's it's not anything more serious than that. Well, when you look at it, the whole 100 years of it, or 120 years, it, there's a definite trend there. Um, I highlighted this area because in the in the six, late 60s and early 70s, there was a real public outcry when the lake level dropped through this period, because at that time, there was a lot going on on the lake. There was a, a recreation happening, sailing club, um, the actual the, the yacht club uh, races were at Cooking Lake before they got moved to Wab Wabaman. Wab yeah, Wabaman, <laughs> sorry. Um, the float base was super active. There was recreational uh, development plans. And so as a result of uh, a lot of public attention, um, there was a, a report produced on it for, you know, what could be done to save the lakes. And it included Miquelon, Ministic, and Cooking Lake. Um, fortunately, I suppose, um, by the time the report was published, it was back about here, and the lake had recovered, and that um, really lost a lot of traction. Or it lost all momentum. Life was good again on the lake for 80s and 90s. Um, it still wasn't behaving like a watershed, but it was um, decent level and water quality was acceptable to, to be in. So from about uh, this line here is 2000. So just before 2000, we started into this slide. So this is where we are now. Um, this point represents the the split between North Cooking and South Cooking. South Cooking flows into North Cooking. Um, so it, that stopped being connected in about 2003. So we've had 20 years of South Cooking Lake being completely closed as a closed body cell. So from a surface water point of view anyway. So that's what that um, graph was about. We brought it out, talked to a lot of people. There's a lot of interest and standing beside it made people realize, oh, that is a lot of water to be missing, you know? So that was the idea behind the full scale graph. Um, this is another view of Cooking Lake. Um, this is our riparian zone. Uh, it, it's in pretty dire shape here. So often the distance is the Cooking Lake Airport and on the left would be the, the town side of South Cooking Lake. So on a on a windy day, when you have a steady northwest wind, it pushes all of the water out of this bay. And in theory, you could walk over the airport, but it's super sticky, muddy stuff. So not nice at all. So I, I just point that out because um, if we have another one or two summers like we've had in the, in the past two, this is what we'll be looking at. I'll just give you a two minute head up, heads up there, Ken, and then we'll move into some questions and discussion. Oh, okay, I'll go quickly then. Uh, this is some drone survey work that we've been doing on, on creeks in and out. Uh, so Hastings Lake has followed the same trend as Cooking Lake. It's down about two meters over the last 20 years. Um, you can see this is the old flow path out into another slough, looking the other direction towards Towfield. This is the old creek bed. And you can see if you leave it alone long enough, uh, it becomes hay fields. So um, I'll fly through these fairly quickly. Mike Boyd was the guy I was talking about earlier. He found it. He's a founding member, scientist, researcher, real connection with the area. Um, together, we were we were working to try to understand what was causing this drastic loss of water because it it isn't just climate change. It, it had to be something longer term than that. Um, our efforts at being heard by government or other NGOs was a real challenge. Um, and 
you know, I can understand that. There's lots of people with concerns that are brought up. So um, we decided that we needed to be uh, a stronger force with uh, membership. And so we created the society, which has now been uh, official since July. And um, put a plug in for Mural Lake here. Thank you again for uh, contributing some seed money to getting us going. That, that was a real help. Um, and we have now about 140 members, um, well represented around the lakes. So North Cooking, South Cooking, DeVille area, Hastings, and Minister. And, and then also including airport um, society and uh, Half Moon Resident Society. Uh, challenges, it's physically a, a big area, multiple jurisdictions that were in the, the Beaver Hills area is in five counties, so that's why we've kind of split off to deal with the area inside of Strathcona County. Uh, obviously, conflicting priorities, like uh, Julia mentioned earlier. Um, this decline has been happening um, for for ever since uh, people started migrating into the area and homesteading. So it's been around a long time. So that said, the fix is going to take a long time um, and so one of the challenges I see will be just having um, organizational stamina to to make it through the next 10 20 years whatever it's going to take before um, real positive uh, change can happen um, so we really are doing this for future generations um, there's also some pessimism that you'll run into because we're not the first society that have, has taken a run at this. Um, like I mentioned in, in the early 70s, there was a huge effort to, to put a proposal together to do something that fell flat. Um, so a lot of those people are still in the area and, and have that memory. So we're, we're kind of up against that. Oops. Um, and the fun part of all of this is when you see something happening on the ground. And I think we have a long road ahead before we see significant change in bringing water back or restoring it, or even um, saving the, some of the riparian zones that are quickly um, disappearing. Uh, another challenge we have is a real knowledge gap with the groundwater balance. Uh, I think that we've lost the, the whole, upper end of this watershed was a recharge area and we've lost a lot of that to uh, just development so um and, and it probably is a permanent loss i don't see any way to reverse some of that so that, that'll be a real challenge to any kind of proposed um solution to bring the water back um mission sounds pretty standard for most for most societies, advocate, educate, collaborate. Um, those are all pretty common themes, I, I think. Uh, we need to raise awareness. We're gonna need public support, right, which leads to political support. Um, so a big, big part of our mandate now is to just collaborate, build connections um, with other NGOs, with uh, folks at uh, NSWA, and try to get a sub-basin report that'll support some future actions. Um, and, and I believe um, the, the solution will be a um, watershed-wide solution. It won't be just for the three lakes that I'm talking about. So we'll just be contributors to a much bigger program, I'm hoping, at, at some point. Um, we've joined up with the Beaver Hills Biosphere group um, with the community of practice for surface water. So that that's a, a big step for us. We're joining um, a, a whole community of, of interest groups with that one single move. Um, and so, yeah, I'll jump ahead. One more, I think. Um, so we've, we've had some successes over, over a couple of years. And now that we're a society, I think we carry a bit more weight when it comes to um, asking for help and, and presenting ideas. Um, so that's where we're at.
That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I noticed that there were a few comments in the chat. Um, Rick wrote in the chat here, we found that declining lake levels were merely a symptom, significant development that involved wetland disruption and roads being built without consideration for proper culvert placement were major factors for why our watershed became less functional. Competing interests and lack of provincial and local government support were major barriers. Um, yeah, thanks for chiming in, Rick. Skeleton Lake, uh, especially the south basin there where Rick's located had experienced really big challenges with uh, low water levels. And so um, happy to have you chime in, Rick, and possibly make a connection here that could be helpful for Ken and possibly also Dan, who's been talking about water level challenges as well. Are there any questions specifically for Ken or any comments or anything from anyone on the call? Just had Rick. one, Brad, yeah. if I could. Yeah, please. Uh, well, first, first, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, great information and uh, really appreciated that. And I don't mean this to sound wrong, but it does make me feel a little better in one sense that we're not the only ones experiencing that, that lower lake level issue. And um, I, I had two quick questions. Number one, and I didn't mention this, but um, in our area, we're told that um, the government used to pay the the uh, the, the the band uh, uh, the Cree Nation band to uh, take out the beaver dams that were blocking the entrance into the lake from the the tributaries that go into Sturgeon Lake, and they stopped funding that a number of years ago, and uh, so we were told that that's also part of the problem for the for the lake level that we're experiencing and so you know we I, I haven't gone farther than just um looking into that briefly but um they used to get enough money that the, the you know the uh the Cree nation band uh, per pelt um that they would that would offset the cost of taking out the beaver dams or whatever it was that was restricting and uh, the ones that were approved to be taken out now they're only getting seven dollars in pelt so we've actually applied to the md to see if they would subsidize this and they are very interested, but I just kind of wanted to ask if anybody else had had that issue. And I also read somewhere that Canada, out of all the G7 countries, supports um, the lakes and and uh, water issues, uh, the lowest amount of all the G7 countries. And I was wondering if that is something that is, is accurate. If so then maybe we need to be starting this on a more national level and working our way down, but just more of a curiosity question. Okay, so everyone's excited to talk about beavers. I saw Kendra raised her hand. Was that about beavers, Kendra? I think mine was just a comment. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, and then we'll jump, you can comment and then we'll jump back. Yeah, I think I appreciate all the presentations. And when I hear beavers, my heart speeds up because I'm at a lake where dams get burst, water levels go high, and properties get flood. So you have property owners who are on the other side of the of the spectrum, I guess call it, that are saying, no, 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 let's keep nature by itself. So that I just wanted to be in our, just to be mindful and aware that there are lakes that <clears throat> we're not experiencing that super low level. Um, and it's a definitely hot topic at our lake. So I just wanted to bring that into the mix. That's yeah, a great comment. Thank you for adding that. Uh, and I other appreciate that too. Yeah, we're learning which ones are and aren't. So being yeah. so early in the process, it's good to know that. Thank you. And then Colin, uh, you had your hand up there. Yeah, I, I just, well, further to what Julie had mentioned earlier about how we have to engage our uh, Indigenous neighbours. Um, the <laughs> Our federal government with with the with the latest uh, truth and reconciliations call to actions, there the purse strings have been opened up a lot for funding, and if if you can have a collaboration with your neighbors, the First Nation neighbors, it's, it's, it could be very very beneficial. I'm I'm just thinking of uh, the Pigeon Lake. Uh, uh, issue they had with the uh, feedlot operation. Um, I, I believe that one of the reasons they were able to overturn that decision and have the feedlot 
shut down was because they had a First Nations on their side. Um, I, I can't I can't stress how important it is to have good relations with your First Nations neighbors. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Indigenous communities are critical stewards of the lakes and the land. And so having them at the table is uh, also critical. So I appreciate that. I wonder if, um, so there's a comment here in the chat from Rick that says Skeleton Lake is also experiencing serious issues with fevers. And Rick and another fellow remove dams almost daily. The beavers have been blocking culverts and that the water flow is managed all the way to the lake so that no one along the way is impacted by water accumulating on their land. So thanks for that comment, Rick. I think that would be good for Dan and, and Rick to connect. Um, I wonder if we have Muriel Lake still on the call here. I don't think so. Um, Muriel Lake has been involved with a number of projects. Oh, David is on the call. I don't know, David, if you can comment on yes. the Beaver yes, Beaver yeah, project. Uh, yes, I'm still on the call. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm fairly new to the uh, the group, but but there is a um, there has been a program of putting something in called uh, Beaver Deceivers, where when you do find a, a beaver dam you put in a device that allows the water to flow through the beaver dam without actually uh, blowing up the beaver, uh, blowing up the dam, um, and the beavers are unable to, to block it. We, uh, I know the, that the, uh, the group has put in a number of those beaver deceivers a number of years ago, and uh, we're planning to do another survey of the creeks to determine where uh, beaver dams are, are now located, new beaver dams, and see if we can increase the flow. We're not, you know, really all that sure how big an impact it had, but uh, we did see a, a rise in the slight rise in the lake level shortly after that. That may have been due to, to more water flow, but um, we'll be continuing to do that. Amazing. And we did, get some, we did get some funding for those uh, beaver deceivers as well. Yeah, and were you working, do you know if they were working with cows and fish on that project or was it the municipality? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I know there was, uh, they did uh, work, do some work with the municipality as well. Okay, great. And we are a little bit over time, but um, if you're able to stay on for a few more minutes, we can continue the conversation here. Was there any other questions or comments from anyone uh, on the call, I see Kendra wrote in the chat, encouraging stewardship groups to connect with cows and fish. Perhaps they can host a beaver workshop and share information on things such as pond levelers. Yeah, cows and fish was the first one that came to mind. Um, we also have a comment here from Julia from Lac La Biche saying cows and fish just delivered a workshop in Plamondon from Saskatchewan Watershed Council in the county. Would recommend contacting them for beaver related issues as well. Uh, yeah, so lots of Lots of suggestions for cows and fish. That's great. Maybe we need to bring them in to these conversations next time. Um, anyone want to chime in who's on the call here? One of the groups that wasn't mentioned was Alice. They don't help uh, WPACs or municipalities, but our job is to make all of our members aware. And Alice has funding for various riparian uh, health projects. They basically pay um, agricultural producers money to put aside land that is sensitive. Um, ALUS, alter Alternative Land Use. Yeah, Alice. They are something really worth looking into. So you guys look into that, okay? Yeah, thanks for the suggestion, Colin. They're um, a great resource as well, alter alternative land use services. Um, there's a comment here from Rick that says, and I think this is a great comment, before you do any studies, make sure that the results will be accepted by the party that you want the outcomes to influence. So at Skeleton Lake, they did an exhaustive number of studies and many of the government bodies didn't care. 
So the lesson learned there is to ask what they need to see in order to become more supportive. I think that's a great suggestion, Rick. Um, I kind of want to leave us with maybe a final question here, and I'll open it up to anyone on the call to contribute. But I, it kind of struck me, I think, when I think it was in Dan's presentation, but I wonder how do we as stewardship groups, as stewards, maintain momentum in years when the lake's not in crisis? I think we don't want to be a, only active because there's a problem and then at the next AGM have nobody show up. So does anyone have any comments about how do we maintain momentum even in years where we're not dealing with a crisis? Uh, Kendra, do you want to start us off there? Yeah, I'll start us off. So our stewardship group's been around since 2015. Um, I took president, pres president role on um, just recently, and we had our AGM this year, and we used the theme of community and connection. So we're really trying to sprinkle in, come out, get engaged, meet your neighbors, or meet people in your community. Um, and we're really trying to install that the more we get outside and be around people, we can kind of get that reconnection following COVID. So we're really trying to tap into a theme because our group too, we we're struggling to have members come out. Um, we did have 26 people and was happy to know that not all of them were board members <laughs> where that's been the way in the past. So I just encourage people to really think about community engagement. Um, what it looks like to get outside and, and do some public engagements around that and not totally focus on uh, we're going to tell you what you should look at not doing. There's too much of that and not enough of the fun. Bring some fun. Give some prizes. We did some donations from local people. We are highlighting them in a newsletter that we're going to start called The Shoreline. And yeah, it's just trying to get community. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I was just at the Myatan Lake Management Association AGM on Sunday, and they're using big shoreline cleanups and barbecues to try and get the community together. So yeah, these, these events that maybe aren't necessarily so controversial or heated, they're just meant to build community, probably goes a long way. And I think our lakes really suffer if as stewards, we become complacent and then we're not ready to rally when there is kind of an issue or a crisis. So yeah, that's great advice, Kendra. Does anyone else want to jump in on that question? Yeah. Brad, uh, I yeah. have a comment. Oh, um, sure. Um, go ahead, Don, and then we'll jump to Rick. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't see who else is have their hand up or anything. But um, one way you might think about uh, keeping everybody involved during the good years is um, have some citizen science projects that are long term. And, and one example, which I think would be very germane to some of the issues that were talked about today, is uh, measuring precipitation. Uh, there are very few weather stations around Alberta. And if you're going to track lake levels, you need accurate data on precipitation. So you could get some citizen scientists who are out at the lake frequently with rain gauges and, and compile a database of, of the precipitation and then relate that to, uh, to water levels. That is the driving force for uh, water levels. That's one example. There's lots of other um, citizen science things that gets people involved and they keep their interest up when, when there's not a panic going on. Yeah, thanks, Don. And I think a lot of groups do kind of use alms programs as a way to engage community. And I think that's great because it's also building some ownership of the data and education. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and let's jump over to Rick. You had a comment. Yeah, a couple of things. When you first get started, we built our watershed management plan back in 2005. And so you have these large, large goals in there and they take time to realize. So what we found quickly to keep people engaged is you needed to get some small wins so that you can show your constituents that you're actually making momentum towards that much larger goal. Because if you don't present them with some wins every now and then, they become a little bit apathetic and they start to disconnect and whatnot. They want to see that you're actually moving in the right direction because if you have many, many years in there as we did without a big win, then we, we found that we had to keep them engaged. In terms of when the water level started to come back up again, 
one of the things that myself and another colleague have done is we manage our watershed in terms of the watershed efficiency and talking about going out and removing dams and just clearing creeks and keeping culverts going and this type of thing. We will bring other people that we know out there. They love getting their vitamin N, which is nature going out there and they love just being part of something positive and when you take some of those dams down and the beavers will build them back overnight type thing and the water starts to flow you get a stirring in your loins and you get passionate about what's happening around the lake there and so involving people like that so that they know that they're helping to maintain that and it really becomes a legacy project for people as much as anything but we have so much fun because a lot of times when you're in a watershed, we're just talking, we're talking about stewardship and all these other types of things. And we transfer our enthusiasm to them. And then they, you know, we duly night, night them and then they go out and they talk about it as well. But when we're out working the watershed, we're very, very strict on having landowner permission to be on their land and talking to the people to ensure that they understand that just because you came with me doesn't mean that you can start bringing all kinds of people onto this land. We have very strict criteria in terms of how we access the land because having those landowner relationships is absolutely vital to working your watershed over time. Yeah, thank you, Rick. The idea of small wins is fantastic because some of these watershed management plan goals are so lofty and so intimidating that it can uh, be a bit discouraging when you don't feel like you're making progress. So that's an excellent point. Um, I think we need to wrap up today's session. We're just uh, 10 minutes over here, but really good discussion. Um, for the folks who are still on the call, if you, especially Dan and Julie, if you want to share any of your contact information in the chat, please do so, just so that anyone who's hoping to connect with you can still reach out. Um, thanks to Don for giving that shout out for Citizen Science Projects. If your group is not uh, engaged with some of Alms' work, which now occurs in both the summer and winter months, um, please do reach out. It's a great opportunity to build some interest and involvement from members or residents in the watershed who might not even be members just yet. Um, I do want to say thank you to Dan and Julie and Ken again for coming out to speak over the lunch hour. I really appreciate it. Alms will be providing a small honorarium to each of the stewardship groups today for their time and for putting those presentations together. Um, I hope that as stewards, as everyone on the call, that we keep this community together and keep the momentum going. And again, if there's ideas for presentations for future Lake Stewardship Community of Practice meetings, please give us a shout at alms here. You can send me an email as well at info at alms um, this presentation was recorded, so over the next week or so, I'll go ahead and get that loaded on our website. And if you want to connect with anyone on the call today that maybe you didn't grab their contact information, just give me a shout and I'm happy to make that connection. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us. I'll go ahead and end the call today. Take care, thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.